when David, my son, was killed, the people that brought me the most solace were actually other bereaved mothers. We have to understand why. I understand why the man who killed my son. It's not that I condone it. Please don't imagine for one minute, but I'm saying free this man if it will bring back a hostage. And we have to take into consideration that the army should be strong enough to be able to free these people. This weekend, of course, marks a very sombre anniversary, nearly six months. Tomorrow it will be six months since that Hamas attack on Israel on October the 7th. Now, um, there were over 1,200 Israelis killed, many hostages taken, many hostages still not reunited with their family. And, of course, the death toll in Gaza continues to rise now, um, well over 30,000. Now... What's been very interesting about the trajectory of this conflict is that, of course, there was a huge amount of of, of sympathy and solidarity and empathy with uh, what happened, terrible events on the 7th of October. But over time, it does feel like even the patience of some of Israel's closest allies is being tested, particularly after this week. So we just want to sort of dig into sort of what's really next. Is there an exit strategy is a ceasefire impossible really to spell out um, now? And what do we think the situation is like for people in Israel at the moment? Because, of course, we know that Netanyahu's popularity is hitting um, a real low. The latest poll by the Israeli Democracy Institute suggests that 57% of the Israeli public um, rates Netanyahu's performance since the start of the war as very poor, poor or very poor. However... There's still a lot of support in Israel for the military action because people are still very traumatised about what happened on the 7th of October. But even many staunch supporters um, are really voicing criticism over Benjamin Netanyahu. Thousands have taken to the streets. Thousands are calling for Benjamin Netanyahu to go. But will he listen? Probably not. Well, let's dig into some of these big questions. We've assembled a really excellent panel of experts who really know their stuff. Um, Welcome to the show, Sir Vincent Fien. Sir Vincent uh, was a former British Consul General to Jerusalem and is now a trustee of the Balfour Project, which seeks equal rights for Palestinians and Israelis, including recognition of the state of Palestine. Sir Vincent, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's good to be with you. And welcome to the show, um, Roby Damelin, who is... We've, we've interviewed Roby before, an extraordinary uh, woman, an extraordinary um, story. Roby um, lost her own child in this long-running um, conflict, but is part of a really uh, powerful organisation called the Parent Circle Families Forum, which tries to bring families together to try and find peace. Roby, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, Sir Vincent, I will begin with you. Um, You are somebody who knows the politics of this region incredibly well, having been a former council general. You're still very much invested in, in, in this issue. Where do you think we are six months on your reflections? And, and what do you think this week signifies? This week could be a tipping point. It's very sad that it takes the death of seven uh, non-Palestinians, non-Israelis, to create the tipping point. Um, You're quite right in your own summary, Aisha, that the trauma that Israel is going through is immense and the hostages need to come out. Hamas needs to release those hostages immediately. I believe there needs to be an immediate ceasefire because... The conduct of this conflict by Israel, starting with the announcement by the defense minister a few days after the 7th of October of a total siege, no water, no food, no electricity, that's changed a bit. But that was the initial reaction. Uh, And it has led to starvation in Gaza with 33,000 people killed, over 172 aid workers killed, over 70 journalists killed. And the trouble with the issue of the seventh of the uh, Monday's tragic incident is that it's not an isolated incident. Um, there are stories, which I believe, of two doctors being shot dead at a Shifa hospital last weekend, two Palestinian doctors, mother and son. 
stories today of amputations at a, an Israeli field hospital where the detainees are shackled. But coming back to your point about where to go, I believe that Israel, which had the moral high ground on the 7th of October, quite rightly, because of the despicable things that Hamas did, it has lost that moral high ground by the conduct of the conflict since then and needs to listen to its friends. And its friends include, of course, President Biden in the United States, needs to, in my opinion, facilitate a ceasefire with Hamas, facilitate the release of the remaining hostages and up the aid into Gaza, which effectively Israel controls because it controls all the borders. Lorries need to go into Gaza at the rate of about 500 a day. We're less than half that now. Okay. Robbie, I want to bring you into the, the conversation now. I mean, you have really dedicated your life to um, building bridges between, um, you know, very traumatised people, people who have lost loved ones um, as a result of this conflict. How do you see a way forward on, on this? Because it feels like there's so much pain on both sides. You look at the suffering of the, the Jewish community, still really that trauma is incredibly fresh in their mind. You look at the death toll in, in Gaza and the injury toll and the, 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 the consequences of, of, of children who have been orphaned, etc. Where How is there ever going to be a way through this to, to peace? Wow, that's a really big question. And, uh, you know, I'm not here to give any kind of political solutions. I just ask people to perhaps take all their opinions and they think that they know. You know, the world has become a great expert on the Middle East and everybody's taking a side. And, of course, importing our conflict into their country. How extraordinary that Israel and Palestine are so on the news whereas Sudan has 18 million people who are starving and 8 million people who are misplaced. It's not that I'm saying that we should not talk about Israel and Palestine, but the world is in a massive mess and you can't just pick one place. I think that we have to look at our belief systems. You know, I, when I think about why people do things, I think about children that grow up in Gaza, like every two years there's a war. They have no shelter, they have nowhere to run. They see their mother running away with their siblings. They have no freedom of movement and no hope. And when you've got no hope, what kind of adult are you going to grow up to be? And then I look at these kids on the kibbutzim up till the 7th of October who felt they were really invincible. You know, there were hundreds of rockets, but they had a shelter. So now there's something that's happened to them. And what are they going to be like as adults, the ones who survive? And then I look at the people who live on the border of Gaza, in Ashkelon, Ashdod, Sterot, these towns, who've been bombarded with rockets, where kids have grown up, with rockets being part of their life. They're wetting their beds at the age of 12. So what kind of adults are they going to be? So here's the work that has to be done and I can tell you that when David, my son, was killed, the people that brought me the most solace were actually other bereaved mothers. We have to understand why. I understand why the man who killed my son. It's not that I condone it. Please don't imagine for one minute, but I'm saying free this man if it will bring back a hostage. And we have to take into consideration that the army should be strong enough to be able to free these people. If we, is, this is what we are claiming. Mm. And I just, you know, I'm, but I also want to bring some hope because I look at the people who are coming out of October the 7th, amazing, amazing people. Vivian Silva, who was burned to death in a cupboard, her son has joined the parent circle and is coming with me to America in June and is talking out for ending the war, for ending bloodshed. People, the whole world has to come and force Israel and Palestine to come to the table to talk because we cannot go on killing each other. Okay. I'm working now on, um, <clears throat> on Memorial Day for uh, Israeli soldiers. We have a joint ceremony on this day where Palestinians and Israelis will tell their personal stories of loss 
and we will have music and we will commemorate all those who have died both in Gaza and in Israel. And I'm just thinking to myself this year, what is it that we can do because it's so delicate. So we are dedicating the ceremony mainly to children in war. Who are the, who are the people that suffer the most? The women and children. Okay. Please let us look at that. Please let us find the humanity in the other. And it's not true that there isn't anybody to talk to. I've spent 20 years talking, talking to everybody, listening with empathy, even if I didn't agree. Okay. Because if you watch the Israeli news and you watch the Palestinian news, that's a parallel universe. And, and the fact that we are continuing to work is a miracle. Well, Ruby, thank you so much for, for that. And, you know, Ruby, you have an incredibly powerful story. For, for people who don't know Ruby's story, Ruby's son, David, um, was killed by a Palestinian sniper while he, David, was, was serving in the Israeli army reserves. And Ruby has spent a lot of time um, trying to sort of build bridges uh, between the two communities.